Today I'm joined by Rhett Larson. Red is fellow strength and conditioning coach and has a vast background in strength and conditioning. Former director of coaching at Velocity Sports Performance, project manager at Exos, mm -hmm. and SNC coach for the Chinese women's volleyball team. Currently working with the women's volleyball team in the Netherlands yep. towards Tokyo 2020. Most notable successes, well, type in diving, Olympics 2012, you'll see a few Chinese flags in the medal count. <laughs> the gold medal with the Chinese women's volleyball team at the Rio Olympics. And you're also a keynote speaker at times. Yeah, yeah. And you have contributed to the high performance oh, yeah, training, training for, for sports. Sport work. Yeah. Oh, so, funny. author, everything. <laughs> you hold a master in exercise physiology at the University of North Carolina. Yeah. Is that uh, Jordan's university? Yeah, that is Michael Jordan's university. You are destined for success. <laughs> <laughs> what brought you into strength and conditioning? Um, you know, I think initially, well, I know initially it was just to get a free gym membership, honestly. <laughs> I, was, I was like at a local Gold's gym and I was uh, taking class. I took this one sports, they call it perform, sports performance class. And it was this, and pretty much just an hour and a half boot camp, butt kicking, suicides, push-ups, plyometrics kind of thing. And I think I'd taken the class four or five times when the instructors quit. And I remember showing up to class one day and the, and the people came in from Gold's Gym and said, sorry, the instructors just quit, but could we have some volunteers to take over the class? And me and a buddy decided we would take over this class and uh, they got us, got us a free Gold's Gym membership, which was great. But I quickly became way more obsessed with planning for this class and trying to make it way better than it had been before. And I was qu quickly forgetting about my day job. And, and that little obsession led to my parents. Uh, my mom one day said, you know, you can get a master's degree in exercise physiology. You could do this for actual living, not just a side hustle. And, and so I started uh, researching getting my master's. And while I did that, I got really lucky that uh, I fell in love with a girl. She lived in Atlanta, Georgia, and so I decided to go down to Atlanta, Georgia, live with her for the summer. And she was like, you know what, I think I can get you a job at my gym. And my gym is a nice gym. And so I said, great. She said, you have to get a certification. So I just went online and said, what certifications do I need? And I saw the NSCA, CSCS, and I said, that one seems to be the best one. I should probably have the best one. And I bought the book and I just read, just read a, chap a chapter a week or something like that, took the test, passed the test, rolled in, and I get the job, and on my second day at the Peachtree Center Athletic Club in Atlanta, Georgia, I have one client. I have this one pregnant woman that they had just given me. You know, she's somebody that signed up for a free 10 sessions with me. And the NBA basketball team, Indiana Pacers, roll in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so the head of – because this Peachtree Center Athletic Club is the place to work out if you are in the NBA, living in Atlanta in your offseason. It has – beautiful basketball courts on the top floor it has you know and it's a who's who of NBA players hmm. well the NBA NDA, uh, the Pacers roll in and they say hey listen we got these five players that live in Atlanta in their off season hit us we, they need a personal trainer to do our program and the head of personal training said well look at our top row of coaches these are the ones that have been training with all the NBA stars for a long time they have all the experience and the Indiana Pacers said okay who has their, which of these guys has their CSCS? And she said, none of them, none of them, none of them, none of them, the new guy. <laughs> and just because I was the only one with my CSCS, my second, and you know, my, pretty much my first clients ever are five NBA players. One of which, after that summer of training him, goes on, uh, by, due to nothing I did with him, <laughs> uh, goes on to have the year of his life. He gets the NBA's most improved player of the year. He gets rookie. He gets um, he gets uh, the first all-star bid for the Pacers, uh, and he's the MVP of the team. Like, it is this crazy thing that he gets, and I get a ton of credit that I didn't deserve for this one dude. And I go from lowly personal trainer to getting to write articles for Men's Health Magazine. And, and just by sheer luck, I stumble into that. And then the next summer, as I'm going back to my, as I've finally gotten into grad school at North Carolina, I'm still doing my summers with the girlfriend. 
and I decide I want a better place, I want another place to train these guys, and I find Velocity Sports Performance that is at the time just two centers in Atlanta. I go there kind of as an intern to study under, and, and this guy, Lauren Seagrave, is there who who I don't know him for him anybody. But turns out he's one of the smartest people when it comes to linear speed in America. Well, I start learning from him. That same summer, Velocity goes from two centers to 70 centers. It franchises out. All of them are looking for coaches that have studied under Lauren. Now I'm graduated, yeah, graduate from UNC with, the, with my degree, and I can kind of pick where I want to go to become a sports performance training coach, having studied under Lauren for a couple of years and have this awesome experience. Oh, not really experienced with NBA, but experienced running the Pacers program and a couple names under my belt. So just a ton of luck went into getting me into the deep end of strength and conditioning. Nice. And you said you had a day job before. What was it? I was going to be an attorney. I was in law oh, firms. Really? Yeah, I a family full of lawyers, and my dad was just so great. When I graduated from college, I just didn't know what I was going to do. And he said, well, before you just default, start looking, trying to you know, prepare for the LSAT and getting into law school, work in law firms for a little bit. See if that appeals to you. And aside from falling in love with a girlfriend that I just had a great time with, you know, who was one of the attorneys there, I did not see many attorneys that were super happy with their either their work or their life, both their work and their lives. And so I just, you know, I didn't want to, I just saw, I didn't want to waste the young years of my life stuck reviewing documents all hours and pissing off my girlfriend or wife. And so it didn't, didn't appeal to me at all. And it was easy for me to make the 180 degree turn. And when I found this, it was everything that a law career didn't seem like it was going to be. We shouldn't waste any years of our life. Yeah, right? <laughs> Amen. So, lucky moments brought you into SNC. What were the dark moments at your in your career? What was the darkest one? Yeah. Um, well, there have been a couple setbacks. There's definitely been setbacks. There's definitely been times when I thought everything was going real well. I, when I was at Velocity, and I was with Velocity, I was with Velocity longer than Lawrence Seagrave was. <laughs> Lawrence Seagrave ended up going and doing other things after about eight oh, he years. he transitioned out. And he transitioned out. Okay. And I took his job as the director of performance at that point. Mm. I thought it was his business. And it was his business, but he is the spiritual founder. Okay. He was never kind of the money behind mm. Velocity. He was the program designer, creator, founder, edu main educator. He was the lifeblood of Velocity. And But when the economy took a skid, I think it became hard to afford him or something. I don't know the mechanic. I was a lot cheaper than, than Lauren, that's for sure. <laughs> and so uh, I kind of came in and took his position. And... Uh, to answer your question of dark side, I wasn't as good at that role as I was coaching on the floor. Mm. And eventually, you know, the CEOs kind of repositioned me. I, I'm good at some stuff. I was good at the education. I was good at creating some, being the face of the company and, and videos and things like that. But as far as sitting down and, and being an innovative programmer for our target demographic, um, that wasn't my strong suit. And I tried to do it well, but I, it wasn't. It, I don't, uh, and people could do it better. And so they started finding better ways to use me. And that, But that was a dark moment, is learning something I'm not good at. Because mm -hmm. at that point, through a lot of luck and and uh, other things, I just I, I kind of felt really good and confident about myself. And that was an ego shot. Mm -hmm. That was an ego shot. Um, but for the best. Uh, you know, me being in a different position also, you know, when Exos came calling with the great opportunity to go to China, I had the flexibility to be able to do that. You know, I at that point I'd gone back to the director, <laughs> but but I was comfortable. To, everyone kind of got it when I said, "Hey, I need to have my feet on the ground coaching some more." I'm mm. I'm losing relevance in the coaching community if people aren't seeing me actually mm. getting sweaty and you know with athletes and out there barking, you know, like and, and having fun. So. I thought it was just going to be a temporary thing when I went to China. I only signed up for a one one year gig, actually just a ten month gig, and then and China just it either repels you immediately or you learn to embrace the suffering. And I'm I'm in the latter camp where I just felt like I felt like my cushy life in Southern California when I was with Velocity was making me soft and uninteresting, and I wanted to go somewhere and accumulate some stories and some adventures. And China was perfect for that. Yeah. I worked in China for some time for the 
Chinese Tennis Association. Yeah, I think you told me that. And um, yeah, I, I was heading the physical conditioning for the Davis Cup team and the Fed Cup team in 2009-2010. So elite. I mean, this yeah. is the best, right? Yeah. Wow. And um, I can relate to what you're saying. I mean, it was a. It's a I don't say love hate, but it's it's a love relationship because I like the way the way. They are working in a way, right? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're treated very fair, you're treated yeah. with respect. And, and, and there's so much compliance. S&C has yeah. a strong <laughs> role. Yep. But then on the other side, for a European, there's not little, very little to do, and you know, it's, 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 it's different. No. <laughs> but it, it's, it's lonely, at it, it's It can be very isolating and very lonely. You know, you're cut off from all the social media apps that maybe you like, you're cut off from, you know, daily conversations with friends who are in a different time zone. Yeah. Um, I think... It, it's one of the things I liked about it is it made me really comfortable entertaining myself again and mm. like kind of getting out of that boredom. Like I, I, I mean, what I don't know what I would do without Audible, like audiobooks. Yeah. You know, audiobooks saved me from. I mean, I, I read thirty more books I, the year I was in China than I'd read the previous three years. I think uh, just because you get all that time, yeah. you gotta think and. You know, it was nice that mindfulness came out while I was in China. I had no distractions in China. It was super yeah. easy to kind of get into exploring the meditative stuff. Mm. Uh, so I'm thankful for that part. I got a lot done there because of that yeah. boredom and isolation. Yeah, yeah, I believe that. What was your best moment? Um, it, it was, it is so cliche, but it would be hard not to say the Olympic gold medal. Like all of that stuff is just cemented. And that's, and that's out of the weight room, but that's one of these wonderful... I'm with just, the divers or with the volleyball team? So, you know, divers got cleaned up when we were there. It, they got eight gold. Yeah, yeah it it's a ton. To right, it's a ton. <laughs> What's funny is when I before the London Olympics, when I was with diving, and I went to the diving the divers, and you say like, "All right, what are your goals? I'd like to know what we're working for." At the Olympics, they just said all of the medals, <laughs> every, every medal. Um, you know, we can only have two people in each, so we want gold, silver in every single one. If we do not get that, we're disappointed. Then we have gotten upset <laughs> if we don't have gold, silver, and every one. So, so I was even though those were great. Uh, before London, I was working with five or six different teams, and so it wasn't like it is when you're with one team and you're yeah. with them. You know, by London, there were still some athletes whose names I was getting wrong. <laughs> so I can't claim that. And I was their strength and conditioning coach, but I would see them three times a week for one hour. And so, it's not the same as when you're with somebody more often. In fact. When I was in London, and this is one of my top one or one or two moments of all time, is I was one of the teams I was with was judo, and and the judo team. I went in for Exos just to give the dog and pony show, right? I came came in to give them, and you know they wanted an agility session and a little bit of strength, and so I was just sent over there just to do try to sell them on Exos, mm. and so. I went over there with, with expectations down here. This is judo. They and they, they got like six medals at the at the Beijing Olympics the you know three years before. Mm. They don't need me. They shouldn't want me. It's now eight months before. At this point, it was like six months before the games. We shouldn't be changing changing their strength and conditioning. So I go over there. I have sixty athletes. They say do an agility session. We don't have any equipment. I don't know what I, I've made something up. And then they said just take them to the weight room. I can't remember what I did, but. All of the coaches kind of were like, hey, that was great, and we'll take bits of it, but pass, 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 pass. Because every weight class has a different coach. And this one coach, who had just been finished training in, in America, said, I want a Western strength and conditioning. So I get with this girl who did not medal at the last Olympics. She was eighth in the world. You know, the little one, you know, the little one they didn't have a lot of hope for. They set me with her. And I'll fast forward through the story. She and I, this is when I didn't speak any Chinese. She spoke no English. We would communicate pretty much through high fives. We had like this one high five. We'd just go back, forehand, backhand, and up. And every time, it's that, that's it. Whenever anything was good, forehand, backhand, up. Good morning. That's how we do it. <laughs> and, and we go to the Olympics. And she gives me the tickets that her parent her parents uh, didn't have the money to be able to go. So she gave me her ticket, her, the, parent, the tickets that the Chinese Olympic Committee gives everybody that their parents can have. So I'm super excited. And I roll in for the, for the day, uh, for the competition. And and if you know anything about judo competitions, you know every weight class is one day, and you is single elimination, and you because you have four matches in the morning. If you can survive those, then you go to the afternoon, and it's pretty much semifinals and our quarterfinals, semifinals, and finals. And uh, and yeah, she wasn't expected to make it out of the morning. Well, she makes it through the morning. Um, 
I don't have a ticket to the afternoon because no one thought she would get that part. Uh, a, a little Chinese person runs up, and I am screaming my head off in the morning. Like she can hear me, and I keep on making the mistake of saying, "Her name's Lily." And I keep on going, "Go, Lily, go, Lily." Go in Chinese is dog. So she would come off the mat, hand up, and she'd look at me, and she'd go, <laughs> "Super cute." So anyway, um, we get to the the. I'm outside trying to scalp tickets to get back in to see her in the quarterfinals, and uh, a little Chinese person runs up to me and says, "Are you Rhett? Lily needs you to have a ticket. She says she can't win without you." I was like, "Oh, this is great! All right." So I go in. It's now packed. I'm up in those bleachers, but she wins the quarterfinals. She wins the semifinals. By the way, she is now upset. She upset the reigning silver medalist, the rain, like the world number three at this point. She's now going up against the best in the world, the girl who's it pond everyone. You know, has won automatically in every single match going up to this. She's going against the reigning gold medalist. And and Lily's a long shot, and she loses. But she doesn't get Ippon. She stays up the whole time, but she gets beaten. And I'm so demor- I'm so sad. Because in China, it's only gold medals. Mm-hmm. Lily had bought me a Nike shirt that just said, Silver sucks. And I was like, and there she is with a silver medal. Mm-hmm. Now, mind you, of all of the women judo, she's the only one that got a medal in one. What was it? All of the all of the former uh, medalists did not podium in London, so she becomes the only one that did um, with her silver. And she's up there, and she's receiving the silver medal. And I can see how disappointed she is. Mm. And I'm scre- No one can hear me. I'm screaming. I'm I'm like in the middle of the stands. I am like, but I'm so proud of her. And she gets the silver medal, and she just looks straight over at me, and she goes, "Ah." <laughs> oh. One of my best moments. Yeah, one of my best moments. I could, uh, yeah. It sometimes makes me teary thinking about it. But she, yeah, I was like, this is why we do it. Yeah, nice, nice. <laughs> what advice would you give your younger you? So if you could travel back in time, what advice would you give a younger Red? Um, <clears throat> I would, I'm so happy I made the decision to go to China. I wish I'd done it earlier. I mean, I was 37 years old when I decided to go to China. Um, my young, like, I wish I'd done that earlier. It, it was the most pivotal thing, it not only just mind expanding, but you know, immediately I go from work having worked with a handful of elite athletes, um, a, you know, a handful of Olympians in America, to having worked with dozens, mm. because I was willing to suffer a little bit in being uncomfortable, being in hotel rooms that were awful, eating food that's worse. Um, But you, if you do that and you invest in the uh, in the experience, all of a sudden you have like my experience grew. I became way more confident in being able to train a ton of weird sports. Mm. Like I, you know, it, not just staying in my lane with the football, basketball, baseball that I'd gotten pretty confident in in America, uh, but having to sit down with a table tennis team and and diving mm. and and being able to deliver something that can convince them that I know what I'm talking about. Mm. So I, I wish I'd done that earlier. And is it specifically China or is it going abroad? I think going abroad. I don't have all the experience except for here in China. And but but I think when you're willing to be flexible and move and move around and uh, then not only you know, China's kind of perfect because not only is it a huge experience but you can make a lot more money. Which is a nice thing to be able to kind of set your salary at a different level now. So now, like you finish time in China, and you're like, okay, my my CV has gotten better, but also like I'm going to only take jobs that will pay me something, you know. Mm. And, and I think that's important. Like I think it's, I, I think that also maybe my advice to myself also is don't feel bad about about wanting to make money like a normal human being. Like I mean, there's a lot of talk about paying your dues and. And, and of course that's necessary and I've done a bit of that but I don't think that I don't think that you necessarily should be just settle for making a, a little bit of money if you've been if you've been growing your skill set and if you have become indispensable to a team yeah. that I have a very strong opinion on that myself yeah? I think because in our job you can also be out of your job for multiple months yeah so and then it's if, true if you have a family to feed that's true I was in that position where I was out of a out of a job and you have a family uh-huh. and you have a newborn child you and need to insulate money, yourself money becomes the yes. <laughs> important right. this is you're right we have a we have a large amount of risk with our team with, with our jobs that yeah that you could be a great SNC and if your head coach is a terrible you know tactician the whole staff gets wiped out. Yeah. And so, you're right, with that riskiness, you should be able to command a salary that, that 
that you know insulates you against that yeah. potential. I'm so glad, yeah, you feel that way too. I am, uh, yeah, I'm always trying to lobby for coaches to. It's not just demanding more, but grow your your skill set so that you give more to a team. You know, like have more more tools in your toolbox so that you become somebody that they can't live without. I, I was just having this conversation the other day because. You know, I like certain bits of tech. Like, you see me in the weight room. Like, I like my K-boxes. I like my push bands. I like my smart speed system. And I have slowly over the years accumulated that, that all personally. Instead of having to go to a job and ask, the first thing I have to do is ask for the tools that I feel most comfortable working with. Like, there's something here. There's investing money, like in the U.S. stock market. But I also think that there is investing in stuff that makes you hard to replace. Like, I like the idea that I just left China. I know they're hurting because they loved velocity-based training. Those girls really, really got into the idea that, hey, when, when, we, when all they were doing was seeing who had the heaviest squat, our, our six best squatters were not our starting six. When I would put 80 kilos on a bar and see who can move it the fastest, then our, fastest, our starting six start to come to the top of that list. And so it's, it was an easy sell for me and the, to the athletes and the coaches. Well, you know, I want when I go, when I take a job here, I want it to sting. Mm. You know, I don't mean that in a bad way, but I want people to notice that I'm, that I'm not just easily replaceable by somebody else because, okay, you lost velocity-based training. It, maybe. I mean, you could always buy push bands, but it's not that easy. Things, K-Box, and the fact that they, you know, smart speed, that we time their sprints all the time. Like, I think that having stuff with you is is just another addition to having a brain that's full of yeah. wonderful knowledge as well. Oh yeah, so advice. What advice? Oh, is this to my... That was the advice, right? Yeah, that's because I got some good advice here, all right. And you know, I was also thinking the other day, when it comes to advice, when I, when I, and this comes from, I think, my years at Velocity, because at Velocity, one of my main jobs was trying to get young coaches up to speed. Uh, that that more coaches need to start investing, I think, in the art of kind of group control, of being able to manage a lot of people in a way that lets that has a certain degree of individuality, a certain degree of, you know, everyone looking like no one's worried that they are, you know, nobody looking on would worry that you don't have control of the situation, that there is there's this wonderful, heady mixture of discipline, of achievement, of laughter, of all those things. Um, I think those are the coaches I find myself drawn to. I think that as a young coach, really important to get like one great methodology that you start from, that you build your foundation on. For me, it was Lauren Seagrave's methodology that we put forth at Velocity, similar to what we had at Exos, because Verstegen and Lauren are cut from the same cloth, came from similar backgrounds. And so all of that was very similar, but I think you know once you get that, like I feel like I'm always drawn to the coaches that seem to have a team that works super hard for them, but also seems to be having way more fun than anybody, and is managed very well, and warm-ups look interesting, and, and, and coaches that have the ability to be creative enough to be pushing kind of those edges of athleticism during warm-ups or movements and stuff, but also give a right amount of, of consistency that there's mastery, that the athletes can start feeling like, I am finally getting better at this hmm. and so I'm I kind of get drawn to what I'm seeing coaches do kind of uh, it's a little less black and white they, yeah. they, they would be harder to write a manual about hmm. if that makes sense that leads perfectly into the next question what advice would you give young aspiring SNC coaches? Oh, yeah yeah definitely spend some time with group control and and I'm I'm happy that I cut my teeth as a strength coach with younger athletes I mean that's one of the things about velocity after the whole um, Indiana Pacers thing, when I joined up with Velocity, the key demographic for them are 8 years old to 18, and so you're getting a ton of high school, and so you're developing your coaching eye, first of all, and being able to see a slower acceleration mechanics or lateral movement crossovers, whatever it is, uh, clean snatches, um, you're getting to see that a ton of times a day with tons of groups coming through, but you're also getting, yeah, you're getting this nice... Uh, practice in controlling groups. If you can control a bunch of 10-year-olds, if you can control 10 10-year-olds 10 throughout a session to keep them focused, energetic, working hard, and then you know, it's no problem. But I'm still having to use group control tactics on the Dutch volleyball team. 
Yeah. It's not like it's just for kids. Like I'm, I'm still having to when I design programming, still having to think through what keep what what decreases any idle time. How does this flow well so that they are less likely to get distracted? Mm. Like I'm still thinking through some of that. Mm. That's interesting. Um, I know you have heavily invested into your own development, right? I mean, mm. within your job, so Lauren Seagrave, Marcus Stegen, but I also know you followed courses from Ido Portal. Yeah. How do you see the role of self-development for younger SPS? Yeah. And, you know, outside of Lauren, like, I wouldn't say that I've had any one mentor. I've just had made a ton of influences. Mm. So, and I love people that are talking. I'm really attracted to people that aren't telling me what I already know. Like, I used to go to some of these conferences that seem to have, they recycle the same kind of speakers over and over again, and all of them are kind of kissing each other's butts, and it's all, it's all kind of the same stuff. Everyone's just kind of, you know, it's all that confirmation bias. You just want to be told that what you're doing is great, and that's yeah. fine. So I, I do find myself attracted to people that are pushing those limits and telling me something that flies in the face. Ido Portal is a great example of that. Like, he's a guy that kind of is shaking up the way, that, at least the way you think. And, and it's... And none of it has caused me to do a full 180 on anything, really, I thought. But I've certainly expanded myself uh, that way. I take, you know, part of my philosophy is is a heavy amount of, like, challenging the, the athletes with different, almost like movement puzzles or different novel, uh, novel activities that I don't let them master very much. I don't do it often enough they master it. So every time they do it, they have to struggle a little bit. And like I said, it's kind of like pushing the edges of that, their athleticism. Like one of our best players on the Dutch national team is garbage at throwing a Frisbee. And it's wonderful because her having to learn to throw a Frisbee, it makes everybody that has to catch her Frisbee have to be incredibly agile. But even she is learning motor patterns, and she's feeling off, right? And that's important to struggle. Like, um, you know, it's part of what I like about China is the struggle. It's part of what I try to put in my programming is a little bit of intelligent struggle that they're always kind of feeling, yeah, not all super comfortable. It's just, and it's always neurologically stimulating. Hmm. Well, I'm looking for, and so when I go to conferences, I'm looking for what can I steal from you that would be really challenging for my athletes. Hmm. And so, I, yeah, I, wow, Ido's a great example. But I'm, I sign up for, that's the nice thing about this gig, is that you know, I'm working most summers, but I have winters off. Uh, mm -hmm. Winters with a lot of free time to either go speak or learn from other speakers. And I just, nice. I take it, so much advantage of that time. Yeah. Interesting. More coaching specific questions now. Oh, give it. <laughs> give it. <laughs> with the I know, the sun's <laughs> baking me. That's all right, that's what I'll do. <laughs> What's your coaching philosophy? Um, yeah, I think we've touched on uh, some of it. As you can tell, like what, what I was just what I was what I was just saying is that I believe in a healthy amount of variety that keeps pushing the corners of their athleticism. Um, I believe in, and in fact, it's kind of my global periodization. In fact, if we were to go take that to the weight room. Because when I'm talking about Edo, I'm mostly talking about stuff that, that I cram into movement prep, like mo cram into warm ups, things that like I'll take from Franz Bosch, like the stuff that I see that we do with the aqua bags and mm -hmm. and trying to get dynamic co contractions and co contractions and perturbations. I kind of wiped. I believe in fully maximizing warm up. Like I would be half of the strength coach. I would get half of the results. I think I would do if I could, were limited to only the weight room. Mm -hmm. Like, I think one of the best changes I've made in the last five years is throwing out the script of what a warm-up should look like, of, you know, a thermogenic, some thermogenic activity, skips, jogs, jump rope, um, what have you. And instead, just micro-dosing strength stuff that I want to be working on. If I'm going to be teaching a hang snatch or a single-arm dumbbell snatch in the next phase, then we're all going to get warm by doing light dumbbell snatches, if I want to teach Turkish get-up, if I'm going to go heavy in Turkish get-ups in my next training block, we're doing a ton of Turkish get-ups as a first thing they do when they walk through the door. I can get them warm in so many ways. I can be teaching them to juggle, I can be making them feel silly with the aqua, making them feel uncoordinated and getting better with the aqua bag stuff. I can be teaching microdosing strength. Um, so I'm a heavy believer in in shuffling a ton of different stimulus in warm-up and 
then stretching them, and then you know dealing with movement stuff too that has enough has tons of variety as well. As, well, as long as as well as a healthy dose of fun, silly shit. Um, uh, but when we get to so as far as methodology goes, like I also believe in in the weight room that. I am manipulate. I'm, you know, I have my exercises that I love. I probably have, let's say, like, five, like four or five, I have five, five lower body exercises that I freaking love that I have to go to war with if I'm training a volleyball team. And but within those exercises, you take any one of those exercises, any squat, and I'm going to play with it. Sometimes having counter movement, non counter movement. Sometimes having accommodating resistance. Sometimes that's a band. Sometimes that's a chain. Sometimes I'm just. I'm just trying to get heavy. Sometimes I don't care. We're all doing the same weight. We're just competing on speed. Sometimes we're competing on speed with a weight that's 100 kilos. Sometimes we're lightening it up like we did yesterday. And 40 kilos on the bar. Grip it and rip it. Who's our most explosive? So, so I believe in a ton of kind of conjugate method of uh, variety and a bunch of programming that way with a ton of variety in warm up. I want every day they walk in to look at the setup of warm up and be like, what the hell is Reckon gonna make us do today? Like, why are there water balloons out here? Why are there this? Why is the TV set up with dancing on it? Like, I want, I want that stimulus. I like that, that lack of monotony. Has it always gone down well with the athletes? So, um, believe it or not, yes. <laughs> I mean, but, footnote, since I've adopted this philosophy, I've been with women's teams, and I think there's a difference. I think it might be a harder sell to men's teams, and I think it might be a harder sell to some sports, especially in China, where the Chinese are so strict and rigid in so many ways in technical training that it's kind of a yin and yang that I provide, and I'm unapologetic about it. Like It's not like I just do this with the women's team. I do it with the Chinese team, too, and, and I can explain it. Like, it, you know, play and this fun, like, it's... It's a compliance issue. Like, if I, I feel, I feel a big part of my methodology is creating an atmosphere where people want to come back, not just for the gains they're making, but it is a, it's an experience that they, that it, it's an experience of achievement. And part of me taking a squat and doing it for three weeks, four weeks, and me watching a standard squat plateau, and then I've already gotten to celebrate everybody's new maxes on that, and then boom, we're gonna throw a band on it. And now I get, I get another chance in two weeks to start celebrating the shit out of that exercise when we start PRing in that exercise. And maybe while this one's plateauing, I've now taken deadlifts and I've decided to do deadlifts on a K-box because that gives me another chance to go nuts when they do well. And so I'm always almost trying to manipulate confidence by constantly creating an environment that is full of achievement in the weight room is definitely a part of my philosophy. Whether or not all of that would work, I think, with with men's teams or other sports, uh, uh, but but I won't guess, I won't tell you that it does. I mean, all I know is it's worked, it's worked with the teams I've been with, which has been a lot of volleyball, but also a bunch of other Chinese teams that have, you know, pretty, are not used to anything but grinding work in the weight room. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, so that's part of it. I think from a philosophy standpoint, you know, a, a way that I've changed, and I don't know that I would, I definitely wouldn't suggest this for other coaches, but in my youth, I was very concerned with being the best technical jo coach in the gym. I wanted to have the best coaching eye. I wanted to be able to see somebody's right leg external rotation when they were sprinting before anybody else noticed it. I wanted to be able to notice and test their dorsiflexion, and I wanted to have that, that was my thing. And I spent a ton of time trying to prove myself as a coach by delivering the most feedback. And I, I was good with positive and negative feedback, but I was just a feedback guy. What I've, you know, what I've learned, and, and the Dutch do a great job of it, especially you know the especially the the Franz Bosch uh, group with is. I wish I spent more time designing pro designing drills and exercises that are more constraints based, that have the athletes kind of self organizing, allow the athletes room to self organize. And without me having to say as much, I think there's a real beauty in that. I think there's a real, I think that's, I hope that's going to be a shift in the way that I coach. Like I hope I continue to get better at that as I continue to steal ideas from what I see around here, because I think that's powerful. I'm sick of hearing myself talk after this many years of coaching too. <laughs> Only so many times I can 
tell somebody to triple extend your dorsiflex. Yeah. <laughs> what are your core values? Mm. Uh, I value intensity. So a value, yeah, I definitely value intensity. Sometimes at the expense of technique. And that is controversial. I, I wouldn't have said that. Probably this is the first time I probably ever said that. But it's true. I, in, as long as the break in technique isn't dangerous, I will, I will, I will do things that will, that will stimulate your intensity before I am just, I'm not going to be the guy that's like, you have to squat perfectly with, every, you can't squat perfectly until you tick all these boxes. Your knees never go valgus, you never do this, you never do this, you never do this. I pick, I make sure that it is good enough that they're not going to get hurt and then I want you moving it freaking fast. And so, and I'll try to fix it on the back end. I'll try to fix it on the back end with other stuff, but I am not, I, I absolutely, and footnote, this is by virtue of the fact that I also jump into teams usually oh, three weeks before our first competition. Hmm. And so there's really not a lot of time to spend trying to make sure everybody's snatch looks great. Hmm. And instead, we, well, this is a reason that I actually don't, haven't used a lot of Olympic lifts in this current, in my scenario that I have, in this, these scenarios where you just jump in for the summer. Uh, but, but I am very apt to, to get people running fast and jumping high and moving weight uh, before I clean up technique. And sometimes things will look bad, but I am just sold on the fact that if you're constantly wired, if you're constantly wired to to demand from your muscles that they go 100%, if that's the message you're sending them more often than not, then you're going to get faster. That if I had if I had a high school track coach here and a high school track coach and one was Lauren Seagrave into speed dynamics and teaching 100 A skips and drills and shuffles and this and that and, and wall drills every day, and then this guy was just having them sprint as fast as they effing could, mm. like 10 times a day, I'm not sure this team beats this team. Mm. Like, I think that, the, you know, as long as there's nothing egregious happening here, mm. I think the body self-organizes pretty well, especially when you're dealing with elites, right? So now I have already, already have a bunch of girls who are doing things very well and been taught by great strength coaches for a long time that I am going to try to work on speed, speed before technique. Yeah. I actually agree with that. Oh, I, I thought I was going to ruffle some feathers here. No, well, it, it depends a little bit. What, what I found, for example, especially working in tennis, right, the mm -hmm. whole speed, multilateral agility kind mm -hmm. of thing, and that is probably personal trial and error. I found if you teach it slow, they do it perfectly, and then increase speed, the flow is still there. But if you do the speed first, you have a good chance of cleaning up the floor. And you bring up a great point. It is, I mean, there's a reason that if I were to ask my girls to do a maximal block jump right now, a bunch of their knees would go valgus. If I asked them to go squat 100 kilos, none of their knees would even inch valgus. That, that, that's easy. A squat, a slow squat is actually easier to do from that point of view than a jump because the body is just organized very well. When you have that weight on your shoulder, everything kind of lines up really well. But does... Does your body recognize that? I mean, are we losing transference from squat to that when it gets that much slower? And so I'm always kind of aware of that. This is why this is why we, you know, we spend a lot more time. We only go one day a week probably heavy squatting. And just to maintain a level of strength, I also believe in that there is a strong enough limit that I don't need to push anymore on girls or on any athlete. Um, and, and I will spend much more time on the other parts of the force velocity curve because I feel like the body recognizes those exercises. The faster I can get with an exercise with a barbell on your back, the more the body's going to recognize it when we get out into the field. Yeah. Oh, I see that. Okay, which person has influenced you most and why? It's got to be Seagrave from, a, from just a full on. I mean, it's been so many years since I was with him that it's hard to, but, but all the foundational stuff it came from him. Um, and I think it served me well being able to talk speed with people uh, even though I don't deal with a lot of linear speed in the last couple of years Chinese diving certainly doesn't need I never dealt with anybody except for handball I, I, I was with Shanghai handball for a little bit where I got to teach acceleration and speed mechanics it was so much fun but I haven't gotten to teach max velocity or anything like that which used to be my bread and butter um, but 
those same principles apply. I mean, I'm, I'm now kind of coming around full circle where I think that my jumping athletes need to be sprinting way more often. I, you know, there's presentations I'm seeing people give more often that sprinting is the new squatting. That, 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 and that's probably uh, a title to get butts in the seats. But, but there's something to be said for this new focus, not new focus, but, but turning your attention towards ground contact times, the application of force in a really quick time, and really as fast as possible, that, that uh, I think has some merit to it. So, so Seagrave definitely gave me um, you know, this foundation of, that I built everything else on, mm. no doubt. And from then, I mean, from that point on, it's been books and stuff. It's like Ido Portal becomes my my weekend mentor and he, he sits in my head for three months and then I see something, you know, I take an FRC course or I take a this, you know, I read a book on this and it all of a sudden that all changes. And so, but it all just feeds this big foundation. Mm, yes. yeah. Okay, as an SMC coach, we work with high profile athletes, right? And sometimes mm -hmm. their idea what needs to get done is different from your idea. Yeah. How do you convince them, persuade them that this, you are proposed course of action? Um, this question is very apropos. I'm dealing with this right now. In Holland, I have a very educated group that knows a lot about their body, that has had probably seven strength coaches before me that were all probably pretty good. You know, every winter they go away to a strength coach that might be a fantastic strength coach. Um, and they come back with, you know, oftentimes with stories of, hey, listen, I had knee pain for a long time. I started doing squats on a BOSU ball and it went away. I'd be like, well, damn, I never would have thought that would, I never would have known that that would have worked, but I've never really programmed a ton of BOSU ball stuff into my weight training necessarily, but if that works for you, we're going to keep doing it. And, and so in my old age, I have gotten so much better, I hope, at checking my ego with this, because of course, I want every girl doing everything that I'm telling them to. But I have, I have, two, I have two athletes right now who just had the best club seasons of their lives and just got pain-free doing what I think is kind of like a blah, generic, kind of boring volleyball program that, all right, just kind of, yeah, I mean, I, but it's working. And when you're dealing with people, uh, uh, the worst case scenario is I'm like, nope, you've got to do Rhett's thing. We're doing all this uh, yeah, undulating periodization with these new exercises you've never done before. Here's a K-Box. And all of a sudden they're getting hurt. They're hurt for the first time. Mm. And so I'm very conscious of at this level, and this was extremely true with the Chinese diving team. At this level, these girls are great. You know, they're, they, these girls are already great. And at some extent, You got to ask yourself, are we losing because we're less athletic than the team across from us? Are we losing because we went against Team China and China trains 80% longer than we do every single day? And it's just tough to beat a team that has done that much tactically. You know, what is the reason that we're not up to some teams? If it's athleticism and and if it's athleticism, if I can, and that is sometimes you have to decide, yeah, you would be much better if you were seven kilos lighter, you know, the, uh, you would be much better if your horrible non-counter movement squat went up, mm. then, then usually the data helps with that. Me being able to show, and, and one of the reasons that I do invest in the technology is I see it's almost like an assistant coach for me. If you, I mean, if you don't believe that you should be doing velocity-based training, let's, let's set up a bar with this weight and see who the best girls on the team are. They're going to be our start. They're going to be close to our starters. They're the ones that are the most explosive. And if you think you can get that by training the other way, by just training heavy all the time, then how's that been working out for you? Because the girls that squat the best are not our best players in one example, you know? So I try to let the numbers inform them. You know, I try to let experience inform them. Hey, I've had an athlete like you. I've had bunches of athletes. You are in the this bucket I call strong but slow. Here's why I bought K-Boxes, because I hope it helps your rate of force development. That I'm hoping it helps you your muscles couple a little bit faster so you can get your butt off the ground a little bit faster. That, hey, you have a great vertical jump, but it takes you forever to have that jump. Mm. Guess what the K-Box does? It It's going to stimulate you on the way down and make you have to work harder to get out of the hole. Mm. And so, and so, You know, having these little elevator pitches for why we're doing something, along with just you know being able to show the numbers. 
that, hey, you like the way that uh, Lonnie jumps. Well, look at Lon how well Lonnie does the K-Box. Maybe we should take a chance on it. So in a team of coaches and support staff, everyone has, wears his own head, right? So mm -hmm. everyone looks at it from his own right. perspective. Yeah. perspective. Yeah. If there are decisions taken that you don't necessarily agree with, how do you deal with that? I'm trying to think of a good example, a recent example. Um, I'm pretty good at knowing my, at knowing my role. And, and this mostly comes up in maybe the medical side of things, right? If I have, if I think an athlete needs to develop, let's say I think an athlete would be much better if she developed her posterior chain. And my physio or my team doctor comes in and says, nope, uh -uh, we need to spend all of our time on anterior chain and quads and isometrics and this and that. Um, I don't think I'm so hard. Boy, Christian, you asked a good one here. Because I do get opinionated sometimes, but sometimes I back off really, really easily. Uh, I think it just depends on how right I think I am. Uh, so whether or not I want to die on that hill. I'm very, I try to be really conscious of, of how important it is that our team is unified. And, and if it's a sticking point, to some degree, more often than not, probably both options will, will help, <laughs> maybe, and I'll never know if mine would have been better. And, and something that starts off as, we're going to go fully this one direction, yeah, it might end up being like uh, in the gray area in between after a while. But sometimes I have to go home and have a have three fingers of whiskey and take some deep breaths and and just suck and be like, all right, she gets hurt, it's on you. <laughs> I I I try not to. I'm lucky right now to be in a situation where where the medical staff we work together really well, and it's that has not been the case in my career. I don't know how it is with with you on BMX, but we we're really good about. You know, and our head coach puts us in a room together just to have these discussions. Uh, a lot where we kind of get to hash it out behind closed doors and then we come to a uh, an agreement and we go so what about you it can be difficult at times yeah um, I think I'm very much with you to make sure the unity of the team is maintained right so I'm very happy to take a step back there have been situations in the past where I thought counterproductive for the athlete or really not the right course of action and then I have stepped forward and mm -hmm. made that point to the coach and to the person. And, but I think that's probably where I align with you. The message we have to give to the athlete needs to be a unified message. Right. So whatever we bring to the athlete it needs to be this is what yep. we do and this is what we believe in. If there's disagreement we do it yeah. in the back room. Uh, and the only times I think I've really stepped up and said that's not good is when I saw someone in danger. Yeah, yeah. Saw that that's really not gonna. I mean, let's put it like this: it's not danger, but if someone has a certain injury, and the advice is take rest. Right. And if it doesn't get better, take more rest. Right. And you know that there are certain principles in rehabilitation that actually work on the opposite side, uh -huh. on time invested, loading, whatsoever, that's when I said, listen, if we take rest, this career might be We're over, take a huge step back. Right. suffer from, he, she, whatever, so right, right. <laughs> suffer from that for a long time, that's when I said, okay, that's not gonna, that's not how we do it. Yeah, do. yeah, and that's, and that's exactly. I, I face confrontation. Normally, I'm not so confrontational. Yeah. In these moments said, when this I saw the time my you're being paid to be con confrontational. Yeah. Right, that's yeah. true. No, that's a great example of when, yeah, you would do it. How does a typical training day in the life of an SNC coach look like? Mm. A lot of it's uh, a lot of it is the brainstorming and the prep. When when I when I decided to go full in on that intelligent, I think intelligent, healthy variety in and in maximizing my warm ups, that means that now I have sometimes twice a day to come up with a new and novel, inventive warm up that has not all of it, but at least a portion of it that's a little bit weird, or, or shuffle things up a little bit. And so I have to do, not only have to track all of that, but also have to figure out you know, when's the, the right time to come back to Turkish get-ups in warm-up. When's the right time to come back to drop steps? 
and warm ups. And maybe today we do drop step races. Like maybe I set up the lasers behind us and they actually have to drop step and run it with lasers. Maybe I've never done that before. So maybe that goes today. And maybe this and this and this and this. So there's planning of putting things in the matrix to figure out where they where they would all fit in a given week. So there's a little bit of that. And you know, that all comes with a lot of setup too. So a given day is I'm always the first coach in the gym because I've got to be there at least 30 minutes before to just set it all up. I think there is something wonderful about the girls walking in and seeing medicine balls in a new place. And now there are, you know, hacky sacks in the corner and they don't know what's going on with that. And, you know, I want it to be interesting. I want a weird cone set up. I want them kind of wondering. I want there to be an excitement. So I take some, I take some time with that, some pride in that. So, but... Once the session starts, once the, for me, with this volleyball team, um, once warm-up is over and I get like a nice 20-minute chunk for warm-up, which is great. Uh, I, another thing that I've done, which it worked really well for me, is that I started, I started looking at volleyball-specific movements. Like, they do have to drop step off the net. Well, if I end warm-up, like, Jamie, the head coach, used to give me like 10 to 15 minutes for warm-up. But then, at about the 12-minute mark, I would start doing very volleyball-specific looking stuff, just with resistance bands on. Just throw a resistance band on them and have them do some some approach jumps. Have them do some blocking crossovers. And Jamie's just like, oh, keep it going, keep it going. That's good, that's good, keep it going. So that expanded my 15 to 20, as now I can, you know, him seeing these, like, low-level strength stuff going on and very volleyball-specific stuff going on. The girls having to hit the ground sometimes. Like, uh, that builds me some time. Anyway, um, to get back to the question, after that, it's helping with practice and, and you know, shagging balls and things like that. I like to say I spend a lot of that time kind of watching the girls and seeing if things are going poorly or asking the coaches if the girls need help on certain stuff. But I don't do that all the time. I, mean, I try to keep my ears open for what I can do to make things... To, to make things more individualized because within this whole special something we haven't talked about yet is I'm a firm believer that we need to individualize programming and so aside from some fundamental exercises that I love um, I believe that that the girls appreciate when we're doing things that are specifically looking at what they need to work on the moment I know that you are terrible at ground contact time or you're a slow jumper you need to have a healthy dose in your program of stuff where you are rewarded for a quick contact time. It's a jump mat on the ground or whatever, or just running at maximum speed. So, the irony, well not the irony, but you know, we sprint uh, once a day or once a week with the girls, and, and the fastest girls don't have to sprint for me anymore. <laughs> I kind of take them out of the sprint bucket. It's the girls that suck at sprinting that I have to start looking at and programming for their weaknesses. And so, I start individualizing. And so, within a week of, of movement prep, there's value in some days keeping the whole group together for that, but there's value in some days of me handing out the girls' individual note cards and saying, you do the three exercises listed here. These are three exercises that are designed for your shoulder that hurts sometimes, for the fact that you don't jump well off of one leg, and the fact that you suck at Turkish get-ups. So you go through that ABC for the next 10 minutes as your warm-up this morning. And you go through this thing. Because, I mean, you know, if we're, you are... If, we are the same. I mean, for me, if my shoulder hurts, I don't want to do anything until my shoulder doesn't hurt. Like, I'll, I'll, I just want to do, you know, I want to do four shoulder rehab exercises and then some squats and stuff. But I'm very aware of trying to individualize things. I've gotten off track. All right, so I'm trying to put things together like that. I want to be prepared for the girls having different little note cards they can come in that are individualized for them. And then, yeah, helping with practice. And uh, uh, this year, I've tried to step up my game as a mental coach expert jamie's made me a de facto mental coach uh so at the end of practice we get some time usually to do some uh some mental training so we'll cool them down and then lay them on the floor and do some some mindful breathing and then we'll do some visualization sometimes sometimes we'll do some gratitude sometimes we'll do some some practice of what we call kind of stepping behind the waterfall like when you are when you've missed two serves and you get up to serve again and all you can think about is the fact that you've missed two serves and that's kind of a waterfall pouring over your head. We, we give them that visual. And we want to, instead of thinking that the whole time, we want to take a step back behind where the water's falling between you and the rocks where it's calm. And you can think back to, I need to serve section between the seam of one and two because these are the two worst players. Like, think something that's useful. And so, anyway. Um, and so I'm spending a little more time this year thinking about the mental side of things and how I can 
in a short period of time every day or every every few days when we get a chance to do it, how we can make the most out of that. So things like that. Our our medical team and our nutrition team and all we all kind of work together really well. So there's a lot of meetings with them as well to make sure that we're preparing for heat and then things like that. And then just a quick rundown: When does your day start? When oh. does it end? So yeah, they, they yeah, right now. Right, uh, so our typical practice day is a morning practice from 10 until 12.30. Then we eat lunch, we give them a chance to take naps and rest, and then we usually resume at around 4, 3 or 4, and we'll go for another 3 hours at night. So it's like usually 3 and 3. And we'll do that for usually 3 days on, 1 day off. Okay. Where does the SNC fit in then? The and the SNC, SNC yeah, oh, sorry, so the SNC goes into one of those blocks is half the team is training and half the team is with me okay. and then they flop. How do you design the training program? I mean that can be a very That's open a right. long question but just yeah, step yeah, yeah. by step yeah. what's okay. the thought process? Okay. I actually did this for somebody just the other day they asked me a similar question and it's it's pretty simple. Um, when we're in the weight room I'm just talking about the weight room right now um, and when we're in the weight room I have two quad sets. I have Four exercises that go together that, that you'll go A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D for a set of five, five sets I mean. And then you'll have E, F, G, H, E, F, G, H, and then you'll do that. And if I have the whole team at once, half the team will go here, half the team will go here so that we're not all on the same equipment. And then we flip flop. So for me, the quad sets work, work best because it just, I think that having three exercises off before you come back to your others, the right amount of rest, it usually this structure gets me out of the weight room in about 75 minutes, which is reasonable. It's not taking too long. Um, um, so within this, my A exercise and my E exercise are going to be my two most important lifts of the day. And this will be a, usually a power speed, like a speed power kind of exercise. And this is a grind. This is something heavy. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, and, and I have three training sessions a week. So in the weight room. And so I have 24 slots. Now I know what this slot is and this slot is for every single day. Those are my six big rock lower body exercises. It is a mix of bilateral, unilateral, eccentric, counter movement, non-counter movement, hip dominant, knee dominant, hip hinge, yeah, right, what have you. And so if I get all those in, that's the main thing that I have. And from there, we're throwing in supplementary stuff. The A, like I said, A and E are both leg exercises. So are usually this C and G exercise also. So it kind of goes lower body, upper body, lower body, abs. That would be a really simplistic. And this one would also. This one's a little heavier generally than the other one. And, and from here, and so now that I filled in those spaces, now I'm looking, okay, all right, so now do I have, have I covered hamstrings enough? Like if, uh, luckily volleyball doesn't have a ton of hamstring injuries, but I've read a couple articles of people that have convinced me that it's good to have some dedicated hamstring time. So I allot one of these two slots for some hamstring stuff one or two days out of that week. And in that, I'm going to mix it up. All right, we're going to go on a Nordboard kick for a while. I love being able to track anything, so that's great. The girls can compete on it, that's awesome. Then we're gonna go physio ball leg curls for a while, and then we're gonna go with something stupid I found on YouTube for a while, like that will do hamstrings. Um, like all of this is that kind of healthy amounts of variety. And I don't do the YouTube thing, but I'll, I'll throw YouTube stuff into the warm ups, right? Any it's like crazy stuff that you might find there. Um, from here. <laughs> Like, I know I need to get the girls rotating. It's a big, heavy rotational sport. So I need to have a dose of anti-rotation and rotation in here. So maybe stuff on the Kaiser. Maybe it's stuff with medicine balls. Um, get that all put in. Once I get that kind of done, I'm like, all right, Ed. I'm not a huge believer in a ton of, like, traditional abdominal exercises. But my girls, the athletes freaking love it. And they love being sore. And they love, and I do like bang for the buck kind of exercises like I like ab exercises that you don't have to do 20 of before you feel it that, that mm -hmm. just kick your ass in five and so I have a couple of my favorites there those might go at the last exercise of the day that they're cycling through um, and then I'm going to want to roll out my jump mat some days and just get vertical jumps during the session I want to make sure I have one day that we're getting vertical jumps maybe I mix, mix it up and we're doing spike jumps for a session um, 
and then and then I just make sure I have some upper body pushes and pulls in that B or that um, F set section. Make sure I have enough pushes and pulls that it looks good. All my favorite, you know, scapular strength or scapular stability and strength exercises that keep shoulders healthy. And so once I've peppered it all in there, and then it, it kind of fills up pretty quickly. That's the general structure of it, though. And every week, like I said, I'll kind of nothing changes altogether. Like I'll kind of. I want every, something to change every single week. So the hamstring exercise will change, or whatever scapular thing we were doing. We were doing super bands before, but now we're going to do like hovers off the ground that I learned at FRC. Or now we're going to do Turkish. Uh, now we're going to do like um, you know a, a, you know a kettlebell up, but farmer carry the kind of thing. Uh, just mixing it up, and they're going to mix up kind of randomly as we go. But those A's and F's never change. And you said you sometimes you switch the A to D and the F to whatever, right. switch it around? No, I try not to. I yeah. only do that if, I, if, my whole weight, if my whole team hits me at once, it was I'm forced to do it. Because I want the power exercise coming first. I hate when that grind comes first, because then I never get as good of exercise after I've cr beaten them up on 5x5 five five yeah. back squats or deadlifts or something. That was exactly my question. Yeah. So if There are constraints in yep. space, it's a constraint, but I, I absolutely will do it. Like I don't make it. I don't tell them that it's a big deal. I don't tell the group that has to go to this group that they're going to have worse. I just know it's not good. Mm. But this is just what you have to do when you're stuck with that. You have to make the training yeah, work. You have to make that. You have to make it work. Do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? Oh man, I saw that. I, I cannot think of anybody around. Here. I mean, I think doesn't need to be around here. Can be worldwide. Ooh. ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, well, that opens things up. Um, let me think on it. For sure. Let me think on it. I want to get you a good, uh, the perfect... I, I have a couple people that I think I can sell you on that have some great Olympic experience that you are fascinated to talk to. My knee-jerk reaction is my buddy David Joyce, who's the editor of High Performance Training for Sports. Just He's a great interview, and he's so interesting and has so many stories. I'd nominate him. He'd love to, love to do it. Where can people find you? Um, in the volleyball hall yeah, and <laughs> here's the thing about China you get out of the social media habit <laughs> so uh, but that said I've been much better about Instagram and Twitter I'm on there you can search uh, you can either search my name Rhett Larson or uh, sometimes my handle is Rhettasaurus Rhett? Rhettasaurus R-E-T-T-A-S-A-U-R-U-S a name made up by my nephew decades ago that I just randomly put into Twitter and I should have changed it years ago and now it's, now it's stuck because now it makes me sound like I'm juvenile but it's kind of cute too very cool yeah thanks a lot for your time hey my great. pleasure sorry to sweat up your couch <laughs>